Okay, concept one of unit two cells. We are going to talk about cell theory and essential organelles. And hopefully these organelles sound very familiar um, to what you learn in middle school life science. So first, what is the cell theory? These are three things that we know to be true about cells. And they are first, all living things are made of cells. Second, cells are considered the most basic unit of life. And three, all cells come from other cells. So we are going to be talking really about these first two ideas in this concept. And then we will be talking about how all cells come from other cells when we get to concept three, which is about the cell cycle. So for today, we're going to focus on these two things, or the first two things. So, like I said, all living things are ma made of cells, but organisms are different. Some organisms are unicellular, which literally means they are made of one cell. So there are bacteria that are one cell. There are um, protists, which are unicellular organisms. They, their entire existence is just one singular cell where most organisms that you're encountering on a daily basis in your life are like you. They are multicellular. This means they're composed of many cells. Um, we as humans are composed of trillions of cells, and those cells are organized into tissues, which are organized into organs, which are organized into organ systems, which make up you as an individual organism. Okay, so this is important because regardless of if you're a bacteria or this adorable puppy, you are. if you're a living thing, you are made of cells, whether it be one or trillions, that doesn't matter because cells are the most basic unit of life. It's the smallest part of a living thing, of an organism, that is still capable of all of life's processes. But what's important to note is even though this is kind of like the foundation of all living things in terms structurally, and functionally, they are very diverse. So all cells fall into two categories. They are either prokaryotic or eukaryotic. Um, in organisms that are made of eukaryotic cells, we say are eukaryotes. Organisms made of prokaryotic cells are prokaryotes. Okay, so what is the difference between these two? The main identifying difference is the presence of a nucleus or not. So I always think pro means no. Prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus. Eukaryotic, which is like you, you are a eukaryote. Yes, they do have this nucleus structure. Pro means no, they do not have the membrane bound organelles. Eukaryotes do. And we'll be talking about those organelles in a little bit. How do they divide? Um, we said in our third tenet of the cell theory that all cells come from other cells, and they do that by dividing. They divide in order to multiply, which is a little tricky, but that's how it works. Prokaryotic cells do a process called binary fission, whereas eukaryotic cells do mitosis, which we'll talk about in concept three. Prokaryotic organisms, all organisms that are made of prokaryotic cells are actually unicellular, which means they're made of one prokaryotic cell. Whereas eukaryotic organisms can be unicellular, like protists, or multicellular, like people. Prokaryotic cells have something called a cell wall around the outside, which has a lot of rigidity to it and gives it a lot of structure and protection, and its cell wall is made of something called peptidoglycan. Not all eukaryotic organisms with eukaryotic cells have cell walls, only fungi and plants, not animals in, um, um, not, excuse me, not animals or humans, humans are animals. So the fungi, their cell walls are made of chitin and plants are made of cellulose. So examples of organisms um, with this type of cell that are made of this type of cell, bacteria are prokaryotes, everything else falls under eukaryotes, okay? So that's really, really important that we notice that. So although we can divide cells into these two categories, all cells, regardless of if you're a bacteria or a flower or um, a pigeon, all 
of these organisms are made of cells that have genetic material, either DNA or RNA, which we can see in the prokaryotic cell is floating, and in the eukaryotic cell, it's going to be contained and protected in the nucleus. They all have cytoplasm, which is just, um, it's this fluid that takes up a lot of space in the cell where a lot of biochemical reactions happen. They all have a cell membrane, which is kind of like the skin around the cell that controls what goes in and out of it. Again, remember some cells have that additional external layer of the cell wall, but all have that cell membrane. And then they all have ribosomes. Ribosomes make proteins. And if you remember from unit one, biology basics, when we talked about the four macromolecules that you cannot live without, proteins are one of those and they are so critical. They run your body's processes. And so ribosomes are critical because ribosomes make proteins. So I did say, if we go back here, that eukaryotic cells have something called membrane bound organelles. And prokaryotic cells have some organelles, just not membrane-bound ones. So we're going to look at um, these membrane-bound organelles in further depth. So organelles are just specialized structures within the cell that work together to help the cell function. So all of the different components within the cell. I like to think of them as mini organs within the cell working together for one main purpose, and that purpose is to make proteins. And through making proteins, it's going to help your body um, function how it's supposed to function all the way down on a cellular level. So um, here's a picture of an animal cell and you can see how it looks different from a plant cell. We're going to talk through some key organelles now and we're going to talk about where you would find these in an animal versus a plant cell. We're not getting into fungi or protists but do know that those are also eukaryotes. Okay so if we are in class right now you're going to take notes of these on your own, um, going through some stations, and then we would just review them quickly. So I'm going to do the same here in the video. I'm going to go pretty quickly through these. Most of these should be review, and I'm expecting you to have already gotten this um, by going through the station cards. So the cell membrane, also known as the plasma membrane. For each of these organelles, we're going to talk about their structure um, in, in very minimal detail, and then also their job, their Function. What do they do for the cell as a whole? So the cell membrane, it surrounds the outside of every cell, and it's made of two layers of phospholipids. So it forms something called the phospholipid bilayer. And because it's made of these phospholipids, it allows the cell membrane to control what goes in and out of the cell. And an animal cell, so here's a picture of an animal cell. It's the very outermost skin of the cell. In a plant cell, it is the inner layer. So the cell walls of the outside, the cell membrane inside of it. In a prokaryotic cell like this bacteria, it is just like the plant cell. You've got the cell wall on the outside and then the cell membrane inside of that. Let's talk about that phospholipid bilayer. So you should be familiar with that term phospholipid from unit one. It's basically just two layers of fats and these fats are specifically called phospholipids like we see here. They have hydrophilic heads, which means they're heads like water, and hydrophobic, meaning water afraid or scared of water, um, tails. So they form this bilayer where the heads are on the outermost part and then the tails are on the innermost part. So when you look at the cell, this would actually be cell membrane. I'll change that's mislabeled in that diagram. This cell membrane we can see how it forms this interesting bilayer and that's what's gonna make it picky about what goes in and out, which we'll get into in concept two in greater detail. Other things that are in the phospholipid bilayer, we say that the cell membrane follows a fluid mosaic model. So it, um, it's fluid because it, ha it has some movement and flexibility to it, it's not rigid, but it's made of a a ton of different structures. So of course you have the main component of the phospholipids, but you also have proteins which are embedded for transport, which we'll again, we'll see in concept two. You have carbohydrates embedded also. These add, um, aid in giving the cell membrane some structure, but they also aid in communication. Um, and that's how all those pieces, all those macromolecules work together to make up the structure. Okay, the cytoskeleton. These are thread-like fibers made of proteins 
usually don't see them in a picture. You can actually see them in both of these diagrams here. They look like these threads, but oftentimes they're not pictured. What they do is they just give the cell some shape and they also help move organelles around. They also provide some structural support for animal cells since um, our cells do not have a cell wall. So I, it's easy for me to remember, I think cyto, they're in the cytoplasm and skeleton. I think my bones give me structure and shape just like this would for the cell. All right, the cytoplasm. It's just a jelly-like substance. It's mostly water. It holds everything in place. And you can see it. it's in plants, animals, and prokaryotic cells. Everybody's got it. All right, let's talk about the nucleus. This contains our genetic material, or our DNA. It's surrounded by a nuclear envelope, or some refer to it as a nuclear membrane, and it has pores that control what go in and out of the nucleus. And its job is to protect the DNA that controls the activities of the cell. So that's where we see it in the animal and plant, and then it's not in a prokaryotic cell. The nucleolus, and I colored this to emphasize the difference between nucleus and nucleolus, that's typically what we see in the middle of the nucleus. I like to think of it as a peach, and that looks like the pit of a peach, if you've ever eaten a peach. It's inside the nucleus, and its job is it makes something called rRNA. That's not a typo. It's ribosomal RNA, which is what makes up ribosomes. We'll talk about this more in Unit 4 Genetics. But you can see it there and there, and again, not in the prokaryotic because um, no membrane-bound organelles, no nucleus. Ribosomes, so important. They are made of proteins in our RNA um, that we said the nucleolus makes. They are located in two places. We, we find them on the rough ER, um, rough endoplasmic reticulum, and then they can also be found floating in the cytoplasm, which you can see in all these pictures. So they make proteins, and proteins run our show. Remember, proteins are so important. We're going to talk about them all year long. So let's talk about the rough ER. There you can see the ribosomes on it, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It hugs the nucleus, as you can see, it's right there, and it makes proteins because it has ribosomes on it. And then it also packages those proteins up to be secreted. So if you remember from unit one, we talked about how there's four levels of protein structure. So they help to fold up those proteins and um, tag them for delivery. The smooth ER is just outside the rough ER. There are no ribosomes on it, which is why we say it is smooth. And the smooth ER does a bunch of different things, but one of the main things it does is it makes lipids, so it helps to make membranes. And you can see it there and not in the prokaryotic. The Golgi apparatus, some um, texts refer to it as the Golgi body. It's right here. It's just a bunch of folded membrane. And what it does is it takes something called vesicles of protein it gets those from the ER. Vesicles are like these mini carts that are gonna move proteins around the cell. So the Golgi accepts those vesicles from the ER and then it processes those proteins, it sorts them and it ships them wherever they're gonna to need to go. So you can see it here and here and then not in here. Lysosomes, these are very indistinct, non-distinct. Um, they don't really look like much but they're very special. They contain a bunch of enzymes, which are proteins that speed up biochemical reactions. And what they can do is they break down dead stuff. So they can break down waste. They can break down invading bacteria. If there's worn out old parts in the cell that need to be disposed of, they can break down those to get rid of them. And then they can also help the cell do something called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. It's basically the cell telling itself to kill itself. And we'll talk about why this is actually can be a good thing when we get to concept three. So I will rarely ask you to label these um, on a cell picture just because they are not very descript, but you can see them pictured here in the animal cell. Note, they are only in animal cells. They are not in plant cells or um, bacteria. Now there is a little controversy among some cell biologists that think there might be some in certain plant cells, but the general consensus is that they're only in animal cells. Okay, vacuoles. In animal cells, we find them smaller and numerous. You'll have several of them. Um, in plant cells, we just usually find one giant central vacuole, and they are used for storage. Centrioles. These are made of microtubules. 
two centriles together are referred to as a centrosome. So oftentimes people will use those words centrosome or centriole in interchangeably, but that's what it actually means. They appear during cell division and they help the cell divide by pulling chromosomes apart. So we'll be talking about these when we talk about mitosis in concept three. And I'm just showing you several ways they can be pictured. So you can see it here in our animal cell. These are also animal cells only. Plants have another um, microtubule based structure that helps with cell division, but it's not centriole. So they are only associated with animal cells. Okay, cilia and flagella. These are organelles that are associated with the cytoskeleton. In their structure, in cilia, they are shorter and more numerous. They're like um, tiny ores. Um, similar projections that are short and numerous but don't move are called microvilli, which you can kind of see pictured here. Flagella are, are longer and fewer. Usually a cell would only have one to three flagella where they may have, you know, 100 cilia. Both cilia and flagella are related to movement. So cilia move fluid across the cell surface, whereas flagella will move the entire cell through extracellular fluid. So this image shows sperm cells, and they have... Um, uh, they each have an individual flagellum as their tail, and they're swimming towards an egg cell, hoping to implant it. Or not implant it, but be the one that is accepted into it, becoming a fertilized egg, which can then be implanted. Um, this picture shows microvilli on the outside of a human body cell, so you can see how they're those stiffer cilia. These are animal and bacteria cells only. We do not see these in plant cells. Okay, mitochondria. They have two parts, their inner membrane and their matrix, which is the more fluid part, which we'll talk about more in unit three, energy flow. Their job, this is where cellular respiration happens, which is an essential, essential process. This is where food gets broken down to release energy in a usable form as ATP. I like to think of the food you eat as a check. A check is valuable. If someone gives you a check, that's great but it's not usable as is. You typically can't walk into a store and pay for something with a check. You want cash. ATP is your cash. And cellular respiration is the process of converting food, aka a check, into something more usable, aka cash, which is ATP. So we'll have a whole concept on this. It's so important. Traditionally, people think of it as the powerhouse of the cell, but that's kind of a, what does that even mean? This is what I want you to know. I want you to know about cellular respiration. Plants and animals have mitochondria. Prokaryotic organisms and cells do not. Chloroplasts. They have two parts, grana and stroma, which we'll talk about more in unit three. This is where photosynthesis happens. This is the process that plants are able to do where they can take in light energy from the sun and convert it to chemical energy, which is stored in sugar that we as animals can then eat later. So it's plant cells only. Cell wall is made of cellulose in plants, chitin in fungi, and peptidoglycan in bacteria. It protects and maintains the shape of the cell. And again, not in animal cells. We're only talking plant cells here um, in our classes, but they're in those too. And last but not least is the central vacuole. So we already mentioned the vacuole, but this is specific to plant cells. It's just one massive central structure for storage. Plants need more storage because they're making their own food source out of sunlight. So they have to have a place to store water and sugars and all of that. Again, plant cells only. So now we're just going to do tons of practice with this to make sure you're comfortable. Make sure you can label different parts in the cell pictures. We're going to compare and contrast prokaryotes and eukaryotes and animal and plant cells to each other. So I hope this brief overview was helpful and I hope a lot of this was familiar.